Hello, it's Tom Donald here from the London Contemporary School of Piano. Today I want to talk about a few topics here that are very close to my heart and they're topics that I only wish um, were explained to me when I was uh, starting out with piano. It would have saved me a lot of time. So today we're going to talk about the six things I wish I knew before I started learning piano. Um, and if you'd like to know more about our content and what it is we do, um, click the subscribe button. and. Uh, well, without any further ado, let's start with the first thing. Now, the first thing um, I wish uh, I had knew, known before I started playing piano was how connected all of our scales are. And for those of you that have had the misfortune of crawling through the piano exam system and learning a bunch of new scales every year and, you know, waiting till it's grade five or six until you start uh, playing the scales in the flats, which is, you know, for a lot of people, eight years later um, since beginning piano. Well, um, that that is really not a very good approach. Uh, and the reason why that's not a good approach is that scales on the piano, all of the scales are generally um, the same standard of difficulty. Uh, there's a few scales perhaps that are slightly harder, but all of the scales, even the scales, yes, with lots of flats and sharps in them, they're actually, in many cases, actually easier than a lot of the scales that have uh, less flats and sharps in them. And there's reasons for that. It's because of the beautiful, incredible design of the keyboard instrument. And, uh, and I only wish this had been shown to me. So I'm going to show you what I mean by all of this. Um, so let's just take C major, which most people perceive to be as the easiest scale on the piano. By the way, it isn't. Um, far from it. Um, when you play a C major scale, I'm only going to talk about a, the right hand to demonstrate this very, very important point. So here's a C major scale. Notice how my thumb goes on C and F. Most of you probably already know that, right? So, my thumb went on C and F. All right, I'm now going to play a D-flat major scale. My thumb went on C and F. All right, I'm now going to play an E-flat major scale. My thumb went on C and F. Okay, I'm now going to play an A-flat major scale. My thumb went on C and F. Okay, I'm now going to play a B flat major scale. Notice how my thumb always ends up landing on C and F. Scales have a universal positioning with our hands. And if you're if you're going through scale books that have lots of you know different fingerings for all of the different scales and you're confusing yourself with it, it's probably because you're just not looking at these more important patterns. And sadly, they're not always really taught about. They're certainly not in the piano exam system. And um, scales can be grouped into just a small bunch of groups, three, four groups of scales that have certain patterns that follow certain um, uh, finger movements. And that's it. They're all connected to each other. And, and really, C major, in that sense, has exactly the same fingering to D flat major. We're just replacing some of the white notes with black notes. But the thumb still lands in exactly the same place. And by the way, this idea that the scales on the black keys are somewhat harder to play, that is absolutely not true at all. In fact, Scales like D flat major and B major are probably the easiest scales to play on the piano because they fit the shape of our hands. Now B major fits the shape of our hands probably more ideally than any other scale. That's because the black keys in this beautiful, wonderful design of the keyboard instrument uh, is lifted. They're lifted higher and that gives our fingers a natural curve. And all those really old, archaic method books that say, curve your fingers. Well, the black keys do that automatically for us when we're playing in keys like B major and D flat major. 
But of course, in C major, if you're spending hours learning the piano in C major, well, your fingers do, you do have to put more effort in curving your fingers because the scale is flat. It's the flattest scale out of them all. Therefore, it's probably the hardest. So which scale did Chopin used to teach to his students first? It was B major. So it's really important that you change your relationship with your scales a little bit. Don't think of scales as uh, these complicated constructs that you have to spend hours and hours memorizing different fingers for. They are all connected. So that's point one, scales. I wish someone had told me about these deeper patterns in scales when I first started learning piano. Okay, let's go to number two. So number two, not a very sexy one. This is a more conceptual one. And uh, some of these uh, six points I'm going to make are more conceptual than others. Some are more hands-on, like the scales. Um, so this is a more conceptual one. And it is about your practice. To document and strategize your practice. In other words, to measure your success with your practicing. Have a notebook that uh, docu documents what it is you're doing with your practice. Set plans and goals for your learning style and preferred genres of music that you want to, to, to construct in your musical program. Really take um, ownership of your practice. Um, there's this saying that gets bantered around all the time, practice makes perfect. No, it doesn't. Just practicing for the sake of practicing, it, that's like, you know, that's like a ship without a rudder, that you need to have a strategy. Um, and practicing is sort of worthless if you don't have a deeper strategy and meaning behind what it is you're doing. So ask yourself questions, annoying questions, yes. And a lot of um, the coaching that I do with my students is really me just asking a lot of annoying questions and building a very well-structured plan with my, with my students. And, and uh, the power of a well-structured plan with practice is I, I can't recommend it um, more strongly enough. I mean, I have students that I only see five to ten times a year. Some students only see once or twice a year, and we just build a plan, and they can then... And, and the tools to execute that plan. So, uh, for instance, ask yourself questions like, what do I want to achieve with the piano? What, what, what music would I like to play? What, what are my goals? Where are my limitations? Where are the areas I need work? Are there areas I need work on that I'm, I'm not aware of that a coach or a really highly specialized uh, teacher can show me? Um, but ask yourself those questions and then look at the limitations you have and then build a practice plan that measures your success. So many people just sit down, practice the piece they're learning, start from the beginning, you know, and struggle their way through to the end. And um, they don't actually analyze their practice. They don't slow down. They, they just start from the beginning of the piece, struggle their way through to the end. But do you ever practice with a certain section of the music? Well, I'm just going to learn the second page of this Mozart sonata. In fact, not the second page. I'm going to, I'm going to look at the left-hand arpeggios on the second page and play them in different positions on the piano at different various tempos. See, that's analytical practice. That's, that's building techniques and, and templates in your practice. So strategized, documented practice where, you, where you're trying different things too. You don't have to, practice is not Groundhog Day where you do the same thing every day. Uh, practicing can be different things. You can have a day where you, uh, you, know, you do more freer, creative things at the instrument. Um, and then the next day you might have something that's more technical, a more technical program that you're working on with your playing, a more analytical one. Um, so practice can be a really liberating thing when you have the right relationship with your practice and you have really good goals and strategies. And um, this is really, really important. And if you need help with that with a specialist teacher, that's, that's important as well. And that's exactly what we do at the London Contemporary School of Piano. We bring people to their goals. Um, with really um, advanced uh, strategies and techniques, regardless of the level. Um, you know, in, in fact, we particularly uh, have a talent for working with people with learning difficulties because that, that's where really, um, really well thought out practice plans are needed. And as a, as a child, I had learning difficulties. I lacked coordination. Um, I was born with a hearing deficiency. I'm not the sort of person that should have, became, um, should have become a musician. But um, uh, so I only wish that I had, uh, you know, these, uh, these practice advices and I didn't just stumble on through and, you know, 
fingers crossed hope for the best so yes document and strategize your practice that's the very unsexy point number two let's go to point number three which is a practical one um, i'm going to talk about chords and scales so chords and scales are linked they're not two different things there's this uh belief i think with a lot of uh people learning piano that scales and chords are two different things yeah okay on the surface they're two different things but they come from the same ecosystem and this will really liberate your piano playing so every scale every major scale produces seven chords which is the main vocabulary of western music and the piano is a is probably the ultimate representation of that so you really want to be doing this on the piano so not only you should be just practicing your your major scales like C major, D major, E flat major, F major, um, going around the circle of fifths, you should be turning them into chords straight away or improvising on them and linking everything together in a holistic way. So if I take a scale like, uh, uh, let's say, D major here. Well, that D major produces its seven chords in its musical vocabulary. chords 1, 4 and 5 are major chords within the scale sequence. 1, 4 and 5. I mean, how many songs, you know, shuffle between those chords? And chords 2, 3 and 6 are the minor chords in that sequence. And chord 7, the odd one out, is a diminished chord. Now, really understanding that will help you learn to play by ear and help you identify the sounds that happen in literally hundreds and hundreds of songs of all genres. This is universal um, stuff and it's really, really useful. And if, you would, if you're really serious about this, please just uh, visit our website, contemporaryschoolofpiano.com and drop us an email and ask for this seven chords cheat sheet and we'll send it to you with our compliments. Uh, I'd really like you to get your hands on this stuff so you can start um, you know, just having these references to help your practice. But you can go much further than that. You can even start improvising and being really creative and resourceful within the scale. So let's stick to this D major example. We don't even have to just play the seven square triads from that scale, though that's a really good thing to practice. We can actually start creating out, making up our own chords and stacking notes together in the scale and making wonderful uh, harmonic sounds with it. Even if I play all of the notes of a major scale, at the same time, I get this beautiful sounding chord, right? So I could start just clunking notes together inside the scale. I call this technique scale stacking, and I only wish um, I did this sooner, um, because look at all those lovely, sophisticated, musical, beautiful sounds I'm making. But all I'm doing is playing the notes from a D major scale and staying within that range of notes. And of course, I can do this in any key I want. I could do this in F major. It's having these dissonant, um, and it won't even ever be that dissonant because it's the scale. It's a really uh, safe um, area of sounds that will always musically harmonize. And in a way, I'm just letting the scale do the work for me. I'm leveraging the sounds of the notes inside the scale, almost like squeezing the juice out of an orange uh, to get all of that loveliness from the scale. And of course, I can apply it to minor scales and other modes and keys, but I thought I'd just demonstrate in, um, in F major and D major. Let me demonstrate in D flat major now, just for fun. Um, so I'm gonna have to tell the software I've moved to D flat major. Give me one moment to do that. Um, but now uh, we were talking about D flat major a little bit earlier. And um, so this is really exciting. Um, and, and I was talking about how, how important uh, it is to play these scales on the flats and, and that they're not harder and that you shouldn't be, you, know, you shouldn't look at those, those five flats and get terrified. If you do, you're completely missing out on something that's actually not that hard. All D flat major is, is all of the black keys on the piano plus a C and an F, which the thumb goes on the C and the F. Um, so you can just start putting your fingers over those notes 
and creating beautiful, sophisticated sounds in the key of D flat major. Am I playing a G flat major ninth plus 11th? No, I'm, I don't think I am. I think that I'm even confusing the software right now um, with these complicated chords. Uh, but all I'm doing, I'm not thinking about chords right now. I'm just stacking up the notes in the scale. I'm just connecting my scales and my chords together. And it's a, um, you know, the, the thing with the piano is so many battles have been won with the development of Western music and harmony and the design of the instrument and the history behind the instrument and the history behind how music uh, evolved. Uh, so many battles have been won for us with tuning and these systems have been built for us to really just take advantage of and that's all composers really do. We're just taking advantage of these beautiful designs on the piano and the tuning system of the equal temperament system. We're just taking advantage of all of that to create beautiful sounds. All these battles have been won for us. And the, the piano design is just absolutely remarkable. Um, you know, people say that, you know, I don't know, an iPhone is well designed. But the iPhone has nothing on this. This design is so intuitive. We've got all of the black keys on the piano plus C and F. And you're in the key of D flat major playing five flats. I mean, tell a violinist that on string instruments, these scales are actually quite hard, but they're not on piano. And, and we fool ourselves with this hierarchical approach that, yes, you start with C major and then you learn G major and you add an F sharp and then you learn D major. And then by the time you're up to grade four, I mean, it's too late by that point. Do these things now. Get straight to these scales on the flats right away. Start stacking notes together, experimenting, making sounds with it. Um, and uh, yeah, I only wish I, I did that sooner rather than thinking I had to wait till I was up to, you know, I don't know, grade five or six, whenever they introduce D flat major. Whenever they do introduce it, it's way too late. This, you know, beginners need to be learning this stuff and it's not, it's not particularly, there's no evidence that it's actually any more difficult than playing C major. In fact, as I said earlier, C major is, uh, is much harder. So, well, that's the third point. Let's, uh, let me talk about the fourth point now. Um, so yes, the fourth point is about theory, music theory. And, and again, one of these things I wish I had known earlier. So my fourth point is don't go down music theory rabbit holes. Now, if you have a bookshelf with lots of books on musical theory, there's a very good chance you still are probably really struggling with it, right? Does that sound familiar to you? Oh, I need to buy another book on music theory. That will solve the problem. No, it won't. So music theory is, um, is a bit like saying how long is a piece of string. I mean, we could go into the science behind the equal temperament tuning system and still not know a thing about music theory. It's, it, you know, the science has complexity to it. And that's not actually going to have any returns on your piano playing whatsoever. So we need to study the theory that's relevant to us. So what is relevant to us when it comes to music theory? You know, I could do, you could go onto YouTube all day and go down rabbit holes about all of the different modes in Greek, you know, Dorian, Mixolydian, and, um, and you could confuse yourself with these complex practice regimes that are going to do absolutely nothing for your playing. They're just going to confuse you and overwhelm you more. So you need to simplify the theory rather than going down rabbit holes. Being a, an accomplished pianist and, and, and complex musical theory don't have necessarily anything to do with each other. Now, there are some accomplished uh, pianists that do have a very sophisticated understanding of theory, but it's not a prerequisite at all. Because when you play piano, you're using your fingers and it's a physical um, movement. So, what theory really matters on the piano? Well, when it comes to the piano, it goes back to the major scale. Um, if you don't know all of your major scales and you're trying to study, I don't know, Mixolydian modes and Dorian modes, well, you're pretty much wasting your time because the foundation of the design of the piano is really built around the major scale. So just learn all your major scales. Now, once you've learned all your major scales, you have a lot of chords that are available to you, but not only have a lot of chords that are available to you, you then have all of these fancy modes available to you. And I'll give you a really good example. The example I'm going to show you is, is the Mixolydian. I was just talking about it. So all a Mixolydian mode is, is a, is a C major or any major scale with a flattened seventh. So instead of doing this, you just flatten the seventh note. 
So it's, it's like a major scale. It's a major scale, but we've just flattened the seventh note. So what happens if I flatten the third and the seventh note? Well, now I've got a Dorian mode, but it really doesn't matter if I speak Greek or not with this. What matters is if I, have a, that if I understand that theory, musical theory, is relational. It's a relationship of things with each other. So, so you know, if I know all of my major scales, and then I just start modifying notes within the major scale, there, I've flattened the seventh again, or I've flattened the third and the seventh, or what if I flatten the third and the sixth? See, I get the harmonic minor. So just by modifying notes within that major construct, I have all of these complicated, apparently complicated, and um, uh, Greek modes available to me. But I don't have to be speaking Greek, you know, um, 24-7. And, and I, I think that a lot of that can be a little overrated. Things like the pentatonic scale, for instance. All the pentatonic scale is, is removing the fourth and seventh note out of a scale, right? That's all that the major pentatonic is. So there's just relationships, but they all can be drawn back to our major scales. So basically, if you really want to get ahead with your music theory, it's just know your major scales and modify them rather than making life complicated for yourself. And again, if you want to, if you want to um, crunch some of these numbers, um, yeah, send us an email at the um, London Contemporary School of Piano website. It's contemporaryschoolofpiano.com and ask for our scale cheat sheets as part of this uh, video. Let us know we've, you've watched this video so, um, so we can send this to you. We'd very happily uh, you know, help out the piano community around the world. So that's uh, how many points do I have left? I think I'm up to point number five now. So this is, this is, a, um, this is a really important one, um, practicing. Uh, back to practicing again. So it's really important that you practice slowly, not just practice fast. Um, and and this is a this is a difficult thing for a lot of students because um, we sort of live in a world where we want instant gratification. So when you're practicing, very very important because modern technology is is a is a real you know it's a real distraction. So, have your phone away from you, no smartphone near you, sit with the music you're practicing, and if it's a piece that's difficult, that you have difficulties with, please, whatever you do, play it slowly. Um, and, and, you know, you have to learn to, to, to jog before you can sprint, and you want to get those movements really, really nice and working uh, and, and you're, you want to have time and space to not stress and, and be chasing the music and chasing the notes. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a piece of music I've been, been practicing for many years, and it's quite a fast piece. So that's uh, Schubert's E-flat major impromptu. Um, but... I, when I practice this piece, I really, I really want to enjoy savouring playing it slowly, not just struggling through it at a fast tempo. Um, I wouldn't want to just sit down and play it at that tempo, for instance. I would actually want to now take a few steps back. So let me now play it at a much slower tempo and really look at the details in the music. So I'm going to show you what slow practice actually really looks like. And by the way, the best concert pianists in the world do this. They do this behind closed doors and, and you know, they're not putting it necessarily on their social media. So everyone thinks they're just playing fast all day. That's not true. Yeah, this is, you know, really good training. So I'm going to play slowly. same passage of music but I want to I don't want to think that slow is boring I think people have these um, hang-ups about practicing slowly because they think it's going to make the music boring or it, it, it it's not a good measure of them as a musician and better musicians play faster or some sort of strange belief systems like that in fact the best musicians actually really know how to pull things back 
and play really slowly and make those calculations. Okay, I'm going to go slightly faster. And you see, the, the great thing is when I slowed down there, I had time to think about my hands, about the movements I was making, the tone I was making. I actually had time to really investigate my plane. All right, I'm going to go up by about you know 20% now. So, uh, you know, for those of you who don't like to practice slowly, I have some bad news for you. If you're not willing to practice slowly, you won't be able to get to that fast tempo without having technical problems. Your fingers will just let you down. So put the time into playing slowly. And remember, um, and it's one of my favorite proverbs, is, uh, you know, the, the journey is sometimes more important than the destination. And when it comes to slow practice, that's a, that's a wonderful example of that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to my final point here. Um, point number six, and uh, this is a this is a really important one, um, and and it's about um, oh, it's about it's about numerous things. This point, it's about technique, though, um, and technique is well. Let's just say technique is a um, is a much spoken about thing uh, when it comes to piano playing and playing a musical instrument. Technique, uh, do I have a good technique? I need to work on my technique, and it's a word that gets bantered around a lot. But there's not much uh, there's not much definition. No one actually defines what technique really is. What is the definition of technique? What do you think the definition of technique is? Um, I'll tell you what technique isn't before I talk about what it actually is. Technique is not, um, for instance, technique is not playing fast and loud, loud and fast. That's not an example of great technique necessarily. Um, you can play fast and loud and it, it can be awful. Um, uh, technique, what, what is it? Technique is, in its most profound sense, is getting the sound out of your head, the sound that you want to create, your ideal piano sound, the sound that you are chasing, that you aspire to, getting that, that sound out of your imagination and enabling your fingers to be actual, actually able to achieve that sound. Now, there are some people out there where fingers and their coordination is brilliant, but they need to work up here. They need to do work on themselves because the sound in their head is actually not that musical and they're not listening enough. Um, and there are some people who have got incredible imagination and incredible sounds and aspirations, but they're, they're not putting the right strategies into their fingers and their fingers are letting them down. So technique is is really a, a very interesting uh, link of all of these things. And a good way to simplify it is really your technique is your brain telling your fingers what to do. And then you asking, what do I want my fingers to do? Um, so how do we improve our technique then? Well, firstly, we need to know what sound we want. So actually, technique often starts with here. And uh, you're really missing out if you don't listen to great pianists. Listen to some great jazz pianists. Listen to some great classical pianists from different eras. Because during different eras, they sounded different. They, they recorded in different ways. They played in different styles. Um, uh, listen to, to great popular music pianists, blues. Try different genres of, of, and, and listen to the different ways that so many people approach piano. And by the way, something about technique. There is no such thing as the right technique to play piano and the wrong technique. Okay, there are certain things that won't work very well if you're really tense. and That's not good for your, your playing. But piano is, is like tennis. It's not like basketball. What do I mean by that? Well, basketball, you know, you sort of have to be tall um, to have a chance of being a great basketball player. But tennis, you know, great tennis champions have been of many different heights and sizes. Um, but the technique of a great tennis player is always very different. You know, the way Federer hits a ball is very different to how, um, uh, you know, Venus Williams hits a tennis ball or Nadal. Um, and they're all phenomenal, you know, tennis players. So there's not just one way to play tennis. There's so many different ways to hold a racket. Some people who play tennis have a double, you know, 
a, a double-handed backhand. Some have a single-handed backhand. Some go to the net more. They're, so it's the same with piano. There's so many different ways to play a piano. There's not just the right technique. So you have to go back to the question of what sound do I want to make? And you want to get inspired by listening to great pianists and go, I, if only I could sound a bit like that. And you make some decisions of the sort of pianist you want to sound like. And then, now that sound is in your mind, now we have to ask our fingers, how do I make that sound? You know, if I want to play pop music, I want to do the Elton type stuff. You know, I want to learn the techniques that are used in that style of music, you know, where, where you know, suspended second chords, and, you know, crushing up against major chords. Um, but if I'm, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm more of a, a classical player, I want to, I want to study my Mozart. I, I want to learn about finger dexterity and evenness, you know, um, and 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 learn about how to get that evenness in my playing through really accurate slow practice and and rotating the wrist and and and, and understanding uh, you know the movements I need to make. Or it might be a variety of techniques I'm learning for a variety of styles of music. This is really, really important that you get that link between the sound that's in your head, the sound you want to create, and you ask your fingers to do it. And it's, it's literally that. Just ask your fingers, how do I need to do this? Do I need to practice slowly? Do I need to relax more when I play? A lot of people get very tense when they play because they're fearing playing the wrong note all the time. Fear will not help you. So, so work that, that goes back to the mind then, telling our mind to not fear things. Sometimes slowing down can really help with that. So I hope today's video and the concepts I've covered have been really helpful. Um, and if you'd like to have access to those cheat sheets, again, just drop us an email at contemporaryschoolofpiano.com. And I look forward to seeing you on our next uh, video.